Good morning. So uh, at the end of last lecture, uh, I told you that the uh, ADS-CFT correspondence in the limit when uh, you can perturbatively quantize the excitation in the bulk field. So you, have, you assume that there is some kind of smooth geometry in the bulk. It can be pure ADS or it can be some other solution to Einstein equation. And then you assume that, uh, that you can perturbatively quantize that system, which in the uh, field theory side corresponds to large N. And uh, in that case, the Hilbert space of the bulk theory will be Fock space of particle excitations. And in that case, one should be able to construct local operator in the bulk corresponding to excitation of particle at particular point. According to the HKLL construction, uh, one should be able to construct such operator in the bulk as a linear superposition of operator on the boundary, but in some restricted subspace of the space-time of the boundary conformal field theory. And so let me briefly remind you how you do that. So I regard ADS D plus one as a solid cylinder. And then we have this space-like section of Einstein space, and I'm interested in constructing local operator located at some particular position in the Einstein space. And then I'm going to tell you where you should smear over the local operator in the bulk. So suppose you have a operator here at position T rho omega, then there is a kernel, or let me use the uh, Rindra coordinate, so uh, z and uh, x, then d uh, x prime, uh, d of z x x prime, o of x prime, plus uh, correction due to bulk interaction and other effects. The question is the domain. So where are you going to integrate? So let me denote that subspace. What did I denote that subspace? Uh, I guess I didn't denote it anything. So let me just call it as C, okay? Uh, so I'm going to specify this subspace. Let me first uh, open up. So boundary corresponds to Z equals zero. So let me open this up and then uh, consider Z equals zero boundary. of uh, ADS, D plus one. So this is a D-dimensional space on the boundary. What I'm going to do is specify some space-like, sub subspace of the space-like section of the boundary. And associated to that, there is a domain of dependence that I have defined, this uh, uh, square region. This is a domain of dependence. So for associated to this Section A, you have this domain of dependence. Now, uh, this is another picture of ADS. So, so here I'm projecting anti space on this two-dimensional two surface. The boundary is here. So, so you, I'm suppressing other dimension of ADS. So in that case, in this picture, this domain of dependence here, so this is a domain of dependence, is just, uh, I'm suppressing all the spatial direction on the boundary. This is a time direction on the boundary. So this is my domain of dependence. And according to uh, HKLL construction, what this she is, is the intersection of future and the past of this domain of dependence in the park. So this shaded region here is she. Okay. So this is interesting. So, so namely that you have more sort of a refined version of the correspondence between the bulk local operator 
and the boundary operator, operator of the conformal field theory. A priori, ADA-CFT correspondence tells you that any operator that you can construct in Antwitta space gravity, gravitational theory should be constructable in terms of boundary operator because you ADS-CFT correspondence says that there is a correspondence between the Hilbert space of ADS and Hilbert space for CFT and isomorphism of the operator algebra. But this, this tells you more, more restricted state. This makes a more st stronger statement. This makes a stronger statement that you don't have to actually consider superposition of all the operator. You just restrict yourself to this domain of dependence. Now, this leads to a puzzle. And uh, the one of you, I, I, I guess, uh, uh, pointed out that puzzle yesterday. And uh, I'm going to repeat the puzzle and then uh, 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 try to resolve it, explain why, why something like that is possible. So there are two paradoxes. OK, the first paradox is this. So let's just consider some space. So, so here I have, uh, let me just give you some, uh, let me see if I can draw this in a nice way. So we have this domain of dependence on the boundary. So this is A, and then this is DA, excuse me. So on the boundary, you have D of A. And then I don't think I can do justice to that, but there is some uh, 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 region C that you extend into the bulk. I don't think I'm doing a good job on that. Uh, so, so you have some, some region in, in the bulk that uh, this domain of dependence extends to. Uh, let's consider space-like section of this ADS. And then draw this over here. So what I'm doing is that you have this. So this is a boundary. This, this is, say, suppose this is t called zero section of uh, ADS d plus 1. Then we have uh, some subspace A on the boundary. And then there is a space-like section of this domain C, right? So the claim of HKLL construction is that if you are interested in constructing operator right here, then you can basically do the uh, construct it by considering superposition of operator in the domain of dependence of A. OK? Yes, please. Excuse me. Yes, 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 yes. You're quite, quite right. This is D of A. And Z and X is in C, which is the, uh, actually uh, what is called, I denote it as C because it's actually called the causal wedge. So it's like a wedge-like region, which is related causally to the domain of dependence of A. Uh, thank you for pointing out this was uh, confusing. So, so, so now, now I corrected it. So integral is over the domain of dependence on the boundary. And this reconstruct local operator in the causal wedge in the bulk. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so this is, this is a construction. But the question that somebody asked last time is that, is this construction unique? Because uh, one could also con equally consider some other bulk region. This is too close to the bank, uh, uh, too close to the middle. So suppose I do this, and then I can consider some other region, say B, and then consider causal wedge. It also overlaps like that. So, and then you can have uh, infinitely many different way of choosing causal wedge, so uh, choosing the uh, boundary region, so that their causal wedges cover this point. But clearly, the resulting operators are different. Resulting operators are different because this op construction is given by operator integrated in this region. This construction gives you operator integrated in this, this region. Those are different operators. So what's going on? That's one puzzle. Another puzzle is this. So suppose, again, you want to construct operators somewhere in the middle of ADS. 
Okay, now suppose you divide the boundary into some segments. Okay, so now uh, suppose we, we try to use, utilize all possible local operators on the boundary. Let's take this to be A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, A7. So then uh, HKLL construction allows you to construct, use, use this operator here, superposition of operator here, to construct operator on this wedge. This will allow you to construct operator in this wedge, this wedge, this wedge, this wedge, this wedge, this wedge. Okay? So even, even though I have utilized all local operator, I can never construct this operator. So this means that uh, this operator would commute with all of these operators. But that sounds puzzling because uh, this exhausts all possible local operators on the boundary. And if this commutes with all of them, so basically there is an analog of Schuer's lemma in the axiom of quantum field theory that if you, you have local operator which commute with all other local operators which are spatially separated, then that operator should be trivial, the identity. So this, this contradicts with this expectation. So you, yes, you have a question. So, so it's even worse, it's even worse. So, so it can cover only infinitesimal region near the boundary. You cannot do anything in the middle. Okay, so, ho, ho, so that's a puzzle. So I'm, I'm just proposing paradox. <laughs> yeah, so if you choose whole region, you can reconstruct. So, so why something, and so it's, it, it sounds like I have succeeded in my presentation because it has caused confusion in the audience. And that was the purpose of this paradox. And then, so, uh, so this, uh, so there is a non-uniqueness, in some sense redundancy, in the description of this local operator. And then there is some kind of puzzle that you cannot, even though you should be able to construct a local operator in the, in the middle by using local operator on the boundary, but you cannot do it piecewise. How can we resolve this paradox? Well, so this was actually explained uh, in a paper by uh, Arum Harry. Uh, Dong and Haro. Uh, one four one one seven zero four one. <coughs> Excuse me, and then uh, subsequently expanded by the paper by Don Harrow and uh, Alan Wall. and then uh, Harrow by himself. So uh, they proposed a resolution, interpretation of this. Their point was that, uh, well, we are not considering any state in conformal field theory. Because if you choose generic state in conformal field theory, those won't correspond to nice, smooth geometry in the bulk or some local excitation around it. You have to consider, you, you must be considering some particular type of state in conformal field theory, which has this bulk geometric description. So we are considering some subspace. So in, you have this total space of Hilbert space of conformal field theory. So total Hilbert space of conformal field theory. And we are considering some particular subspace which has geometric interpretation. And something like that seems to be happening when you are considering operator on this subspace. Okay, so they, they ask themselves, well, have you seen anything like that in some other context? And indeed, uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, in the field of uh, quantum information, people have been uh, cons discussing the way to do uh, error correction in quantum communications. And uh, they have come up with the idea of cold subspace of uh, uh, the Hilbert space. Uh, which enables you to uh, encode uh, quantum information in a robust way. And uh, 
that construction of subspace, it turned out, has features that are very similar to this. And uh, some of the more recent paper actually made this point sharper. So let me just briefly explain what that construction is. Okay, so the idea of error correction is an old one, that if you want to send some data in some channel, the data can be corrupted, and what would you do? Well, the, the one of the way is to introduce redundancy, right? Basically, for example, repeat yourself. Say, suppose you want to send a message one, two, three. Well, if you just send it once, maybe the two may turn into one, and it become one, one, two, one, one, three, and then the, the message gets corrupted. One way to avoid it is to repeat yourself, say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, three times. And then even if one of the data gets flipped, you can decide by majority vote that how to correct it. So that would, that would work out fine for classical data. Unfortunately, it doesn't work uh, in quantum mechanics because uh, you cannot make copies of quantum states. So there is a, 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 a theorem called no Cronings theorem. Which basically says the following statement, that uh, there is no unitary operator, U, on acting on the tensor product of Hilbert space, such that uh, if I pick any state on H, then you acting on psi tensor, some reference state, gives you copies. So if you can do that, you can copy the state. So then instead of sending psi, you can send psi tensor psi. And if you can have many copies, then, then you can do the same kind of things as, re, re, you can same, do the same kind of redundancy, introduce, you can introduce redundancy in your communication and correct it. Unfortunately, you cannot do that because of this no cloning theorem. So what can you do? So, so the idea is that you can do, actually you cannot do this, but you can do something very similar to that. And so that is the idea of code subspace. So let me, explain the notion. So here is an example. So let's consider again, now, con uh, so previously we considered two state system, but let's consider a three state system. So H1 is a tensor product of three states, one, zero, one, two. H2 is a tensor product of, again, three states. So you can consider this kind of three state. H3 is like that. So you have three copies of uh, Hilbert space. Like that. And then uh, associated to that, I define state zero tilde, which is uh, one over square root of three of uh, zero, 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 plus uh, one, 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 plus two, two, two. One tilde is one over square root of three of uh, zero one two plus uh, one two zero plus two zero one and uh, three a uh, two tilde excuse me is one over square root of three of uh, zero two one plus one zero two plus uh, two one zero. So, okay, so those belongs to the tensor product of the uh, three identical Hilbert spaces, right? So this is H1, H2, H3, okay? So I, const so I, I have some kind of redundancy. So, so there are nine, so there are uh, three, so, tw there are tw so this Hilbert space is 29 dimensions, and in this 29 dimensional Hilbert space, I pick three states. 27, excuse me, 27, 27 dimensional Hilbert space and I picked three states out of, out, of the, out of this Hilbert space. Okay, so now I'm going to encode data. I want to send one of these three states, but instead I'm gonna send one of these three states. Okay, and then the data may get corrupted, so how can, can you correct it? So the idea is the following, that uh, on H1 tensor H2, 
you can actually def define some unitary operator. There is some unitary operator U, U let's call that U12, okay? So that it has the following property, that uh, U12 tensor identity acting on the third entry, and uh, if I pick any one of this, so I is one, two, uh, zero, one, two, then this is going to be I tensor square root of three, zero, zero, one, one, two, two. So this is an interesting operator. So, so namely, that if you give me one state, this give, give you, so this i is uh, zero, one, two. So if you want to send zero, for example, what you can do is act, you start with that, act inverse of this, and it gives you this state. And then if you get that state, you can act on it and you can reverse it. So, so you, can, you can do this operation. So, so this, is, this, is a, 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 this is a, this is a actually a very useful operator because this acts only on the first two entry. So that means that you can recover this, suppose you send this operator. And suppose during the process, the third entry, the third Hilbert space get corrupted. So you lose the information. But since this, so you can still act on this one. Huh? And then you can recover this information because this does not, this acts trivially on the third entry. So we can, we can say it more specifically in the following way. So suppose, so, so if you can utilize this operator uh, in the following fashion. So suppose you have any operator. Suppose you have any operator O acting on the first Hilbert space. Uh, suppose you have some any, so this is an operator, and this is a matrix element. So suppose you have any operator acting on the first Hilbert space. Then I can upgrade that into unitary operator acting on these three subspaces. So three-dimensional subspace in the following way. So I can define a new operator O12 hat as U12 inverse O U12. So, so the way that it acts is that first of all, and then, and then tensor I3. So this one acts trivially, this one acts trivially on the third entry, it mixes up first and second entry in such a way that O12 I tilde is equal to J of O I J. Uh, actually, it's getting, I should, I should write it over here. So I tilde acting on this is like this. So, so if you have uh, if you have this operator O in the first Hilbert space, I can do this operation to construct operator acting on this. Uh, oh, by the way, so this code subspace H code is given by this th these three states. Okay. So, uh, so what, what this, this, this procedure is doing is that if you have any operator in the first Hilbert space, you can do this operation to define operator in this code subspace which acts exactly in the same way. And, but this procedure is tolerant against the corruption of the third Hilbert space because this is, uh, this is not acting on the third Hilbert space. And so even if, so for example, during this procedure, the third Hilbert space is corrupted, you won't get affected. You can always make corrections by doing this. So this is the idea of code subspace. So this is very close to 
repeating yourself, the, the, the introducing redundancy in the classical uh, error correction, except that uh, you are avoiding this problem of quantum no cloning theorem. Okay? Sorry? Yeah, that's right. So you have to know where the corruption happens. So what you can possibly do is that do it three times, and then they make corrections. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so this is this this you need to. So, so this this one you. So, so for example, in this procedure, if the corruption happens in the first entry, then it won't help you. So, so this will help you if corruption happens in the third entry. Yes, yes, I agree. Uh, but the point I wanted to make here is that uh, this structure is, th and these structures are very similar, and in fact, uh, you can make this more precise. Uh, namely, what is happening here So let's compare this story. So here, the story, so I, I hope I, 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 uh, what, uh, what the, uh, uh, the situation is clear. OK, so maybe I, shouldn't, I should make one more point. The important point is that I can do this procedure for any one of the three Hilbert spaces. So namely, that uh, so let me write it over here. So, so for any. Uh, uh, o hat acting on this, which goes like this. You can have uh, O one two, O two. We can. It's, it's obvious that you can do that for all uh, 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 Hilbert space of two three or three one. So you can have two three O three one, such that uh, O one two acts on this like this, and then 2, 3 acts the same way, and 3, 1 acts the same way. So all these three operators act exactly the same way, except that O1, 2 acts only non-trivially on the first entries, uh, non-trivially, and then the, the, it acts trivially on the third entry, and O2, o, 3 acts non-trivially on the second and the third entry. Etc. Okay. So, so look, we have the situation where you have actually three different operators acting exactly the same way if they are restricted to the code subspace. So, so, this, so, so the, the point is that this is exactly like what is happening here. Namely, so the, the, pro, the, the proposal that has been put forward is that in this total conformal field theory, Hilbert space, there is some particular subspace. This sort of have the geometric description, which now, according to this idea, can be regarded as some kind of called subspace in such a way that uh, uh, we, can, we can have the following situation. So the conformal field theory Hilbert space, uh, as we discussed uh, in a couple of lectures ago, we assume can be decomposed into Hilbert space associated to region A and uh, the, its complement. So, uh, and then similarly for cold subspace, there is a subspace associated to this region A. Uh, let me call this region. A, and then corresponding uh, uh, causal domain as small a. So this is a bulk region associated to the capital A. So such that uh, if I pick any state from uh, this code subspace, then there is, uh, and then if you pick any operator acting on the code subspace, uh, associated to this region. So, for example, this local operator right here is an example of this. 
Then there is some operator A acting on this region such that uh, uh, o, OA acts exactly like uh, O over here. So this is, this is what is happening here. So for each, for, for any boundary region A, uh, for any bulk operator associated to it, you can choose operator restricted on this Hilbert space, which reproduces this operator. But if you, if you just require that for some code subspace, then uh, as I demonstrated over here, you can have such a situation without contradiction. And uh, uh, so this is actually uh, more, more, more sort of, uh, this has more content than just analogy, in the sense that uh, the, the fact that you can have this construction means that the way that region A and say region B, for example, are entangled for, uh, associate for, uh, within this Hilbert space is very similar to the way that uh, the, these states are entangled with among, among these, Hilbert, these Hilbert spaces. So in the next uh, two lectures, including this one, next one, uh, I would like to so exhibit uh, how to characterize such entanglement. Yes, you have a question. So H of capital A is uh, the Hilbert space, subspace of the Hilbert space on the boundary CFD. Yeah, yeah. Small a is the Hilbert space associated to this. So we are assuming that uh, the bulk can have a perturbative quantization of the gravitational theory. So certainly that, that you have a Fox space here. So if you have a Fox space, you can consider, just like you can decompose the boundary subspace into segment, you can decompose the bulk space into segment. Right, right. So you have, a, you, have a, you have a tensor, you have a decomposition of this code subspace into tensor product of uh, that associated to this domain and its complement. Yeah, so what I'm doing is that I'm interested in constructing operator acting on, acting on, on, on here. So, so this is a subspace of H code. No, 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 I'm not saying this is a subspace of this. Oh, because, because this, both of this, both of them belong to HCFT. You are worried that whether this is a triviality. That if this is identical to this, then, then this statement is a triviality. But that's, that's, not, that's not the case. The, the only the so, 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 so bulk operator can be reconstructed, but that does not mean that Hilbert spaces are the same. Okay, so, so. So, so this is an analog of phi, uh, this is an analog of phi. Oh, okay. So I'm taking this, uh, uh, this I'm taking this uh, uh, as an, uh, phi is an example of this. So phi is an operator which say creates local state in the bulk, which is still, I mean, any operator is an operator on conformal field theory. So, so we, can, we can say it in this way, but so oh, phi is an operator acting on this code subspace. And I'm saying that that, op that operation can be reconstructed by operator acting only on this subspace. Ah, yeah, yeah well, because code sub this is a subspace of a Hilbert space. So, 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 so H, H code, so this, this, this belongs to here. But I'm not saying that this belongs to here. It's a different decomposition. Uh, so, uh, 
so let me see. This equation is exactly the same kind of equation that I'm sort of exhibiting over here. Uh, yeah. So here I have in mind H code to be the, so suppose you, so I assume that the bulk has smooth geometric description. I'm a perturbatively quantizing it. So, so you have uh, some fog space with small perturbation of this geometry. And that's my H code. Which is a subspace of HCFT because this contains much bigger perturbation and including black hole and even non-geometric kind of configurations. Right. Yes, I'm not saying that these correspond to here. I'm saying that this, this is clearly subspace of this. Yeah, yeah, so associated to this choice, I, I choose the domain of dependence on the boundary, and I choose a causal wedge, and that's more A. Yes, 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 yes. So associated to this choice, I have this decomposition. And then I'm saying that the causal wedge, so this type of uh, causal wedge recon uh, reconstruction, or sometimes called ads or reconstruction, is a claim that, uh, uh, any local excitation in this cold subspace in, associated to this region can be reconstructed in this way. And sort of this is formalization of this statement. I'm, I'm saying that this formalization, if you formalize it in this way, then this has exactly the same kind of feature as uh, this uh, quantum error correcting uh, uh, procedure. Sorry? H. Yeah, Hilbert space of conformal theory on the boundary. So the statement of ADHCFT correspondence I repeat is that Hilbert space of full Hilbert space of the gravitational theory in ADS is isomorphic to the full Hilbert space of the conformal theory on the boundary. And in it, in it, there are states which can be described in terms of geometry and small excitations, and that's I'm calling it cold subspace. So I assume that according to ADS-CFT correspondence, that uh, the bulk geometry in the large end situation can be described as smooth geometry with some small excitation around it. And this is a formalization of that statement. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just like here. So you see, there are three operators. And that's exactly, you asked that question. There was a, who asked that question last, at the end of the last time? That there was some redundancy in the definition of operators. So namely that somebody asked whether this definition of local operator is unique or not. And uh, so, so, so here, for example, here is an example. You have three operators, O1, 2, O2, O2, 3, O3, 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 which acts exactly the same way on the cold subspace. So there is a redundancy in the definition. And this redundancy is exactly what you need for error correction. And uh, here you, have, you, are, you are seeing exactly the same kind of redundancy in the bulk local description, that this same operator can be described in a multitude of ways depending on where, which, which interval you choose over here, which, uh, which part of the boundary you choose. Am I answering your question? Yeah, I pick, I pick any state that is sort of either ground state of this geometry or some small excitations. Yeah, yeah so OA, you don't, so some OA takes you outside of the cold subspace, but I'm saying that you can choose OA so that its action on cold subspace stays within the cold subspace. 
This is an example. These operator, keep, so if you consider generic operator in the tensor Hilbert space, 27 times 27 <laughs> matrix, then that will take you outside of the code subspace. But this, these three operators keeps you within the code subspace. So, so, so I'm saying that there are analogously here you have such operator. Okay, you have a question. Yeah, so it stays, operation stays within code subspace. Yes. What, what's one, two, why this is one, two, one? What do you mean by one, two, one? Yeah, so, so in the case of this operation, OA is this one. Ah. Well, it's non-local. Who told you that OA is a local operator? Ah. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't. O is only associated to capital A. So here, in this construction, OA, uh, OA is a linear superposition over this space. Oh, by the way, this integral is over the causal domain. But since this is causal domain, e even if you have operator here, you can actually bring this back to here by the Hamiltonian evolution. So, so, so this can be written as integral over the, the operator restricted to this Hilbert space over here. OK? All right, so now, so, 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 this, so, so, uh, so this, is, this is sort of resolving this kind of paradox. And but then you can ask, well, so how can, how, so this is, okay, a good story, but why should I believe that this is actually the way that the entanglement is happening? So I would like to uh, 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 tell you a little bit more uh, detailed information about how geometric states are entangled and uh, try to quantify that. So that will be the uh, point of uh, uh, my lecture for the remaining set of lectures. So I'm, let me uh, first uh, uh, motivate. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, one way to quantify entanglement property of holographic states, a state that belong to this code subspace, uh, in terms of uh, uh, holographic entanglement. Entropy. But before uh, I get into this subject, uh, let me motivate that by discussing entanglement of a particular type of states, and in particular the uh, uh, eternal black hole in ADS. So let me first tell you some gener general thing about uh, mixed state in conformal field theory. So there is a notion called the purification. So which is the following uh, uh, notion. So at a, in my first lecture, I told you about an uh, uh, ensemble of quantum states and the density matrix associated to it. So suppose we have an ensemble of states. So you have a state uh, with probability pi. So in order to describe this, so on, on the Hilbert space, in order to describe this, you consider some density matrix, which is given by this uh, expression. And uh, the purification is the following concept. So if somebody give you a density matrix, you can actually c construct a pure state, but not on this Hilbert space, but in a bigger Hilbert space. So what you do is you consider another Hilbert space, so I did not as H children. H children can be isomorphic to H or bigger, uh, so that it has an orthogonal basis psi i children. Ah, excuse me. So so these are excuse me. These are psi i 
by i. And then, uh, so these are orthogonal bases. And then I consider a state which can be expressed in this way. And this belongs, obviously, to H tilde tensor H. Okay? So uh, the point of this construction is that you can recover this density matrix, rho, as a partial trace over this density matrix, so, so this, this uh, uh, new Hilbert space. So I introduced this new Hilbert space H tilde, but immediately after that, I traced it over and go to back to the original Hilbert space. So this procedure is called purification. Namely, density matrix in general is a mixed state, but then there is a pure state associated to that in such a way that partial trace gets you back to the original density matrix. So this is called purification. Now, note that the purification procedure is not unique. There are lots of redundancy. There are lots of arbitrariness, because I haven't told you what kind of basis you choose. And as far as these are orthogonal bases, then you can purify it. So that means that, uh, so for example, uh, you can have a, a unitary operator on the new Hilbert space, and you can act uh, this on this thing. So where u is acting on h tilde, but is acting trivially on the first one. This is as good as this one. Namely that you, you can consider this as a new pure state, and then if you take partial trace, gives you the same density matrix. Okay? So here is an example. So suppose uh, we consider a canonical ensemble. So the canonical ensemble uh, has uh, free energy. Oh, no, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the canonical ensemble uh, can be expressed in this way, where you have a Hamiltonian uh, H hat, and the beta is the inverse temperature. Uh, of this distribution, and then z is a normalization, so that trace of this is going to be one. And you can write it as a sum over all the uh, energy eigenstate, where ei is an eigenvalue of h hat for this state. Okay, so now I can purify it. Uh, for simplicity, I take H tilde to be the same Hilbert space as this one, and I use the same basis. So in that case, we have what is called the sum of field double. So, so we can purify this in the same way. So note that this is beta over two, just like I had square root here. I had square root here because uh, that's how I, uh, so here I psi is square. So I had to have a square root here to get the uh, right normalization. So similarly, I have beta over two here. And then we have i tensor i. So this thing belongs to h tensor h. Okay? And this is called the thumb field double state. This is, this is, so, so, so make, making the mixed state into purely pure state by in adding extra Hilbert space is not something that is a, a sort of artificial, it, it's a very natural thing. Because if you think about how you learn the thermodynamics in undergraduate, uh, the way we learn uh, uh, thermodynamics is that where you have a thermal state with temperature T, but the, the way that you think about thermal state is that, in fact, it is in some, you have some extra states, which is a heat bus. 
And then total space, so, so you have a density matrix, but the total space state can be pure. But then this, uh, my target state and heat bus can be entangled in such a way that if you forget about heat bus, which is the same as taking partial trace here, then you reproduce this uh, summer ensemble. So considering this purification is something that is very sort of natural from this kind of consideration. Namely, the relation between micro-canonical ensemble here and the canonical ensemble here. OK? Now, it is well established that if you have a thermal ensemble like that, then in the, in the conformal field theory, then ADS dual of that is a black hole. Namely, more precisely, ADS dual of uh, this thermal state, 1 over z times e to the minus beta h hat, is a thermal gas in ADS. Uh, when the temperature is low, D is a dimension. And then it is actually the uh, ADS towards field geometry. When the temperature is high. Note that beta is an inverse temperature. So beta below this means that you are in high temperature. This means that you are in low temperature. It's kind of counterintuitive. Beta is 1 over T. Okay, D is a, a dimension of the conformal field theory. You have a question? I'm setting ADS radius, ADS scale to be one. And I'm also t setting, so in the CFT side, the scale is set because I'm quantizing the system on the sphere. So the sphere has a radius, so that's a set of scale. And that gives you the, uh, a scale that measures the high temperature and the low temperature scale. That will be a CFT side. In ADS side, you have ADS scale. Okay, so you measure the temperature against that. Yeah, okay. Sorry? Ah, okay, so the thing is that, uh, so, so, so if you have a finite temperature thing, then what, so what we mean by finite temperature is that if you analytically continue time in Euclidean direction, it will be periodic with period two pi beta. Uh, two pi beta, or uh, the period beta, I guess. And uh, so you, the geometry, so you have to have asymptotic ADS geometry with the Euclidean signature, and uh, time direction is periodic by beta. There are two types of solution to Einstein equation with cosmological constant with that property. One is that just takes a pure ADS space, Euclidianize it, and periodically identify it. That's one solution. And another solution is that you put black hole in it. With, and they adjust the mass of the black hole so that Hawking temperature gives you this temperature. So you have two solutions. So you have to choose which one. And then you have to choose the one for which the action is smaller. Because uh, you have two possible quantum states. And then which one dominates depends on which action is small. So this was uh, studied by Hawking and Page. And they pointed out that depending on the temperature, when the temperature is low, then it's more advant advantageous not to make black hole but just have some thermal state. But then if you, as you raise the temperature, the, black, the action for the black hole becomes smaller at some temperature where uh, one, over, one over T is equal to two pi over D minus one. So there is a critical temperature. There is a phase transition. Okay? So what happens is that suppose you have ADS, you heat it up. When the temperature, so you start, you turn on the range and then you heat up, you start, creating some particle, you turn on heat temperature more, you create more particle, 
And eventually, at this critical temperature, these gas or particles collapse into black hole. So this is a critical temperature for formation of black hole in ADS. Okay, so that's why you have two phases. Okay? So, so now, so this is how, so let's pay attention to this phase. So in Lorentzian signature, the black hole, the, the, the Penrose diagram of a black hole in ADS looks like this. You have singularity here. So this is maximally extended black hole geometry, where uh, this is a one boundary where you have time direction times uh, d minus 1 square. And then you have another time direction, and then d minus 1 sphere. So you have actually three regions. So let me denote it 1, 2, 3, 4. So you have these three regions, and here is a singularity, and these are singularity. These are horizons. OK? So, but the interesting thing is that if you consider Lorentzian signature ADS, you have actually two asymptotic ADS regions with two boundaries. Both of them have geometry R times a sphere. Whereas in the original ADS, you only had one boundary. So if you have a pure ADS, you have only one boundary, and you associate conformal field theory on it. But it turns out that if you go to high temperature phase, and if the space-time collapses into black hole, Suddenly, you discover that actually you have two copies of the boundaries. Both of them have the same geometry. So what's going on? So Marda Senna, uh, uh, in 2001, proposed that uh, this geometry actually describes the puri purification of the finite temperature geometry, namely that since you have two boundaries, it's natural that this state belongs to tensor product of the conformal field theory. And uh, this, this, therefore, is dual to conformal field theory state, which is a sum of field double. Which is the tensor product of CFT state. So uh, I should uh, probably stop very soon. But so, so these states correspond to this state and this state. Okay. So uh, more, more uh, 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 precisely, uh, each one of them correspond to, so for example, the first entry here describes this state. So naturally, this region 1 is under control of this side. And this region 2 is under control of this side. And somehow these two Hilbert spaces are entangled, even though it's, you have two independent conformal field theory Hilbert spaces, but they are entangled. And the fact that they are entangled is represented in the dual, uh, geomet dual ADS gravity as black hole geometry. Uh, I should end here, but I just wanted to make one comment and for you to think about tonight, and then we can discuss tomorrow which is that uh, I told you here that uh, there are actually choices you can make for the basis. Namely, when you do the purification, there are, you can choose any orthogonal basis on the other side. So that's what it means is that you can perform unitary transformation on this side, and you can still make the thermal state. So that means that if you are interested in this constructing thermal state, and uh, and then if you are only interested in constructing pure state, whose partial trace reproduce a thermal state here, we can perform a unitary transformation here. Such unitary transformation include operation to create states in, in this side, because these are operators acting only on this side. So you can shoot lots of uh, energy in these directions, for example. You still have the same thermal state. So if you just know that you have a thermal state here, you don't know what's going on here. So, so you think that the uh, ADS dual of uh, thermal state is a uh, black hole, and you create this state. And then you think that, uh, well, since this is uh, ADS black hole, 
the geometry near horizon is smooth, so you can go inside of the black hole, and before you hit the boundary, you'll be safe. But then you get surprised because suddenly you got hit by all these energies because you didn't know what kind of basis the other person is choosing. Somehow this is related to the firewall paradox, I think. But uh, this is something you can think about. Okay, so thank you. And, uh, <laughs>